I represent today a sure harvest ministry. This is one of the very few Adventist ministries that's sharing the gospel with Muslims around the globe. How many of you know the population of Muslims, by the way, on our planet? Any idea? Thank you. A lot, yeah, 30, right? right? 1.7 billion. Do you know how many of them being exposed to three angels' message? Hold on to your seats now. Less than one-tenth of one percent. Do we have a work to do? When do we need to do this work? Thank you for that now. It's radical, but uh, I am a little more radical. I say yesterday. By the way, you are receiving the ministry envelopes, and you probably begin to understand what they are for. But as you receive them, don't let it distract you now. Put them aside. We'll come to it at the end of the service. As we coordinate outreach to Muslims, we are producing and broadcasting television programs to 1040 window. Let me take you through the brief PowerPoint presentation, and maybe I can share with you the testimony. And in the afternoon, will be a little more. So on this map, you could see global distribution of religions, where all the colors indicate different religions, but the dark green color indicates where majority of Muslims are residing in our world. And uh, as we produce, we broadcasting and covering 1040 window with the gospel of Jesus, which is home to 4.6 billion of population of our world, out of which 1.5 billion are Muslims. And as we broadcast our programs received in the following countries, more than this, but this is the main countries we are targeting, they are Muslim countries, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, Europe, and... Uh, of course, North America, number of other countries also in the Middle, in the middle East and the, uh, the um, Central Asia, which is former Soviet Union. Now, we are receiving many calls from those regions. At times, we cannot handle those calls. And you know what they're asking? They're asking for the Bibles. And when we're receiving these calls from Iran... We want to send the Bible, but we know this is deadly thing. Because the moment the Bible will arrive there, the person that is the recipient will be traced and they will never see this person again. For that, we have a solution. I'll come to that. <clears throat> the dark brown color on this map indicates where the population of those regions from 65 to 100 percent never heard the gospel yet. We know that about 33 percent of global population are Christians. From 33 to 40 percent already heard the gospel. And from 27 to 34 percent never heard the gospel yet. That means from 2.5 to 3 billion people on our planet never heard the gospel of Jesus yet. More than 1 billion Muslims do not know a Christian personally. If you reverse it, it will be this way. More than 1 billion Christians do not know a Muslim personally. Whose fault is it? Who received the commission? Ellen White said when the Immigrants are coming to a Christian country. This is an act of providence. So they can hear the gospel and take it to their homes, to their countries. Unfortunately, most of the Christian countries came to the point that not only they don't share the gospel, they don't even know what the gospel is. And that's why we see what we see today in the world. And our ministry is involved in the following uh, Things that uh, we do presentations as one of them is taking place today at Bremerton Church, morning and the afternoon session where the church members and conference with advertising inviting all the local churches to participate and to learn how they can reach out to Muslims and give the gospel to them. On our own, we cannot finish the work. 
We're training people, church members, pastors. We have uh, virtual churches that uh, people from different countries participate in the worship of Muslims, former Muslims, became Christians. And now we, number of them we are sponsoring, and they are giving the Bible studies in their countries, some of them radical countries. And whenever they walk out from the home, they don't have no assurance they will come back home alive. Our ministry is sponsoring these people. We have uh, training seminars, networking with uh, Muslim leaders. Uh, in fact, the church that we do the presentation, we connect them with the mosque because uh, the see Muslims are relating to 20 our fundamental biblical beliefs. To 20 of them out of 28. Well, evangelicals relating to us only on 13. When we eat with them, you know what they say? As they look at our plate, they say, brother, we share Jesus with them during the meal. They say, we, see, we look at your plate, whatever is coming into your mouth is clean. Therefore, whatever is coming out of your mouth must be clean also. We believe what you say. God had placed the Advent movement in such a unique position and equipped us with so much knowledge to reach out to these people, to bring the gospel to them like no other denomination. There's no other church will ever finish the commission in bringing the gospel to Muslims. It is this movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement, that God had raised to restore the gospel and to proclaim to all the nations. So, uh, you see all this, what we're involved, I'm not going to go one by one, <clears throat> but... Uh, uh, we can talk later about the details. This is the website, uh, our main website, that you could actually uh, invite your uh, Muslim friends, if you have one, and uh, have them study the Bible. We have Bible lessons in the website, Muslim-friendly, so they can study themselves and come to know Jesus. You can take a snapshot of the website. It's assureharvest.com. This is another website in the Middle East that is uh, uh, very active. In fact, uh, we use all the media, all the, for, uh, the, the apps on the phone, uh, you name it. Whatever is existing in the media today it, uh, is at our disposal. And uh, we don't have to be present in that country because if we go there, we never come back alive. <laughs> but uh, the satellite television, mobile apps, and a variety of different things that we have, uh, they are reaching Muslims. And on this website... We have about 600 people acquiring about Jesus on a weekly basis. So this is a baptism that uh, the, uh, one of the students of our workers on the ground called the, the, our person who is, uh, well, we call him lay pastor, but we don't use the word pastor. So, and... Uh, he told him, I am standing by the pool of water, and I have this urgency to be baptized in the name of Jesus. He asked him, where are you? He said, I am at the construction area, and there's a pool of water. He said, is the water pool? He asked him. He said, I don't care. I want to be baptized in the name of Jesus. He came and baptized that person. This is happening today. This is the sad part of the, the whole thing that we are doing. Out of all the funds allocated for foreign missions... Uh, about 80% of the funds we are spending to send missionaries to Christian countries. This we received from General Conference, by the way. 18% of those funds we are spending to send missionaries to countries that already heard the gospel. And 2% left to evangelize from 2.5 to 3 billion people on our planet. How soon do you think we are going to go home? Not soon with this. But I believe that the last day's event will be rapid ones. With me or without me, with you or without you, the Lord will finish this work. He will cut it short. So I want to be part of it. What about you? That's why I have received the ministry envelope. And uh, today it is your opportunity. Whatever was done by this ministry up to date was done by the support of people like you from other churches. Today is your opportunity. So, and as we broadcast, uh, this is, by the way, a website. You can take a snapshot, take it home, and uh, keep it whenever the Lord impresses you. That probably will be the time when the ministry is needed. So, uh, but let me share with you at least one testimony. Would you like to have it? Yes. But you know what the stories and testimonies do to the worship time? It chew the time. 
Yeah. You still want it? Okay. One of the uh, viewers of our shows called us, uh, and the call came from Iran. This woman was watching our programs, and uh, Pastor Gerald, who is giving training at the, the Bremerton Church today, he was uh, on a phone with her. He was on TV, actually, first of all, and uh, as he was finishing the, the message that was translated, I mean, the broadcasted, he invited the audience to pray after him. And as she is calling and communicating with Pastor Gerald on the phone now, the call is interrupted 19 times by the government because they're tracing every call. And they're using calling cards, so at least they will not be traced who is calling. That is safer. So 19 times she's calling to finish this whole conversation, which I'm sharing with you. <clears throat> She said, I was watching your programs. One of the shows that you asked us to pray, when I prayed, repeated your prayer, and I said, amen, I felt like heaven came down into my living room. My husband came back from work that evening. I shared with him that uh, I became the follower of Jesus. Since then, she said, my husband is beating me brutally every day. My two little boys were taken away from me, and they said that mama cannot raise you anymore. On ad in addition to it, she said... Uh, Doctors found tumor on my liver, and they say it may be can cancer. We need to have the operation. And then she began to weep on the phone, asking us, did I make a mistake by accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior? I have no Bible, no churches, no Christians around. Please help me. My husband is going to kill me. And uh, we know that The Quran contains a certain passages that were taken from the New Testament. They say something beautiful about Jesus. And by the way, uh, we do not promote any other book. The only book by which every human being must live by is the Holy Bible. Period. Whether you are Christian, atheist, Muslim, Buddhist, whoever you are, the Holy Word of God, the Bible, is the Word of God. But they have taken from the Bible, from the New Testament, placed in the Quran certain passages which we shared with her and said, sit next to your husband, read it to him, we'll call you in a week. So these are the verses that we gave it to her <clears throat> that is found in New Testament and in the uh, Quran. Uh, if anybody interested, I can share this with you. We can make a copy, you can have it. So it says in those verses that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the word of God, Jesus is the word of truth, he is mercy from God, he is righteous and Jesus is holy. Keep in mind, not a single human being is righteous or holy. This is a divine attribute. Now, if you're logical, you can conclude this. Whoever you are, whether Muslim or Christian, they can conclude this. If this is a divine attribute, and the Quran calls Jesus righteous and holy, then he is the divine. And you don't have to prove to them that Jesus is God. No arguments. And this is all in their book. Now, it says that Jesus is a life giver. He was raised from the dead. He is coming again. He knows the future. He is to be followed and obeyed. We shared this with her and said we'll call you in a week. But we did not call her in a week. We are so busy traveling. And uh, we totally forgot. Sorry, but you know how it goes. Three months later, a call came from Iran. The same woman was on the phone, but with a totally different attitude. You know what she said? She said, I have read these passages to my husband, and since then, he never raised his hand on me. My two boys were returned to me. They love me. In addition to it, in addition to it she said, I've been taken to the hospital, and before they took me to the surgery room, they said, we need to take another x-ray to make sure that we are doing the right thing. They took the x-ray. There was a tumor. They said, we need to operate on you. They rolled me to the surgery room. They opened me up. When I woke up from the surgery, my bed was surrounded by doctors. They were scratching their heads saying, you have, no sur you have no tumor. And then she said on the phone, brother, I know that Jesus is alive. And I want to serve Jesus. I will start the church, she said. Gerald, screaming on, her, her <coughs> on the phone, said, please don't do it now. They will kill you for sure. Just watch me, she said. Just watch me. 
She said, I will go to a neighboring country of Armenia. I was born in that country, which is a, a Christian country, first Christian country in our world. Anyway, she said, I will buy a land there, build a church so my people can cross the border and come and worship Jesus there without fear of being persecuted. We were skeptical. A few months later, call is coming from Armenia. Guess who is calling? Your faith is rewarded. The same woman. And uh, she said, I'm already in Armenia. I've got a land. I have 15 people with me, and we're building the church. Please send to us literature. Later on, Frontier Mission reported to us that because of that woman, we have now 30 Muslims, Iranians baptized into Adventist church. At the last general conference session, I was at San Antonio, and uh, I bumped into one of the Russian pastors from the division and said, Grant, did you know that because of that woman, now we have 43 Muslims, Iranians, baptized into Adventist church. One person affected by the gospel, what affected broad? And CBN and TBN gave us the statistic. When you have one response to your show, this is statistic that they gave us. This is an indication that... 1,000 viewers were affected, but they could not, for one or another reason, to write or to call. And we are receiving hundreds of calls. At times, we cannot handle them all. By the way, by the time that we were on, maybe I should share this story with you in the afternoon. Enough stories this morning. In the afternoon, you ask me, I'll share with you at least another one testimony, okay? But uh, that's what the ministry is involved in. We have a number of stories, outstanding stories, and uh, as I mentioned, that uh, there is no support. General Conference, North American Division do not have funds allocated to reach out to Muslims. So we are on our own. They like what we do, they know what we do, but funding is not present. But, you know, that's why we are one body. Amen? One part of the body cannot reveal the fullness of God. It requires the entire body. And we are one body. And with that united body, God can do wonders. Okay? We'll touch on this in the afternoon. By the way, if you like the message in the morning, you're welcome to come in the afternoon. If you don't like, feel free not to come. That's a bold statement, huh? It is a bold statement. Maybe the testimony from the uh, atheism to Adventism may attract you, but I'm not counting on that one, okay? I'm counting on this. So, I'd like to ask you to bow your heads with me as we will be opening the Word of God. Gracious, loving Father, thank you once again for your presence with us. We claim the presence of the Holy Spirit at this very moment as we will be opening the Word of God, that you will speak to us in a very special way, that our hearts will be touched in such a way that when we walk out from the church today, we will not be the same as we came in. And this will be the result of the effect of your Word, Father, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. <clears throat> An artist's daughter lost her sight at infancy. Her blindness was considered incurable. And for years after her mother passed away, her father was her constant companion. Then a new surgical technique promised to restore her vision. And when she laid in her hospital bed, recuperating from the surgery, her brightest thought was, now I shall see my father. The day came when they took off the bandages from her eyes. She opened up her eyes and for the first time has seen her father. As he embraced her, she exclaimed, I have had a good-looking father all these years and I didn't even know it. My dear brothers and sisters, we have such heavenly father and so many not even knowing how gracious Loving, compassionate, tender, merciful, forgiving, holy and just our Father is. Because the true picture of God was distorted 
in the Garden of Eden. But I praise God it was restored on the cross of Calvary. So the best way to see that undistorted, irresistible picture of God is to look at the cross of Jesus. Today, I will draw that picture of God, undistorted picture of God, using scriptures that as you behold that picture, you will not be the same. And if you choose to come to the cross every day of your life, every morning of your life, and to behold that undistorted picture of God, you will be changed into the likeness of what you behold. Are you ready to come to the foot of the cross this morning? Amen. In the Gospel Workers, page 315, the following statement is found. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. At the very heart of the gospel message is the truth concerning the cross of Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul made a statement in our scripture reading that the message, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. According to Apostle Paul, the power of God is in the message, in the preaching of the cross. And I can state boldly that today, this scripture will be fulfilled in your hearing. Because the cross of Jesus will be lifted up. Not because you have a guest speaker today. The cross of Jesus, that's where the power of God is. But for that, we will need to come to understand, building the base, the foundation, we need to understand the cross of Jesus from the Jewish perspective. Then only we can begin to grasp the meaning of Christ's supreme sacrifice and His unconditional love for each one of us, of which Apostle Paul made a statement in Romans chapter 5, that while we were ungodly, helpless, sinners, enemies of God, God had reconciled us to Himself through the death of His Son. Have you ever wondered why the cross made such a tremendous impact on the disciples and early Christians? The disciples spent three and a half years with Jesus. They traveled with Him. They heard Him preach. They were taught by Christ. They witnessed His miracles. Yet, in spite of all this, at the end of three and a half years, they were still a group of greedy and self-seeking men. Who will be the greatest? But then came the cross, and it totally transformed them. Now they are willing to be spent and to die for Jesus Christ. Why? Look at the early church. The Bible tells us that they have turned the world upside down because of what the cross meant to them. No wonder Apostle Paul made a statement that I want to glory in nothing else but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Apostle Paul understood the meaning of the cross. So what is it that made the cross the central theme and the central subject of the New Testament preaching? And why is it Apostle Paul saying in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, that Christ had humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Why is He emphasizing even the death of the cross? You see, the problem of most Christians is that they look at the cross from a very narrow point of view. We know that even though Romans crucified Jesus, they did the act, but we are not to forget that they were fulfilling the desire of the Jewish leadership. And for the Jewish mind, the cross had a different meaning. Crucifixion was not a Jewish custom. The custom was to stone. Why? Then the Jews are shouting, crucify him. Let's take a look at the cross from the Jewish perspective now. Crucifixion was introduced by Phoenicians 600 years before Christ. Later on adopted by Romans as the highest form of punishment for worst criminals, runaway slaves, rebels. The Jews hated crucifixion, yet in this case they are shouting in one accord, crucify him, and Jesus submitted to it, even to the death of the cross. What did Jews have in mind when they shouted, crucify him? I will let the word of God answer this question. In Romans 8.32, Apostle Paul made a statement that God did not spare his son. What is it that God did not spare His Son from? From death. But which death? Was it first death of which uh, 
Jesus himself spoke, it is asleep. Lazarus died, and he said, Lazarus is sleeping. Or Apostle Paul speaking here about the second death, eternal death. Open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John now, chapter 19. John chapter 19. We find Jesus here at the Pilate's court. Pilate questioned Jesus, did not find anything, <clears throat> anything in him deserving death. Verses 1 through 6. Then in verse 7, the Jews answering Pilate and saying, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die. What law are they referring here to? The same verse answers the question. Because he made himself the son of God, that is equal to God. Did they have a law that condemns the one who makes himself equal to God? Yes, the law of blasphemy. God gave this law in Leviticus, Leviticus 24, 16. Open your Bibles with me. Leviticus 24, 16. Let's see what it says. Leviticus 24, 16. If you dare, says, say amen. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. So this law, not only saying that the person had to die, but also how he had to die, right? To be stoned. So the Jews are telling to Pilate, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die. Did they know how a person had to die, or they forgot about it? Let's take a look what the Bible says. A number of places that can prove us, but one of the shortest one is John chapter 10, where Jesus is speaking to the Jews, and he is saying, by the way, I am not putting down the Jews today. I am just trying to bring the understanding, the perspective of the Jewish mind to the cross. We are not to forget that we have received the oracles of the truth through the Jewish nation. We are not to put them down. We may be in the same danger. We know that. Now verse 10, verse 30 in chapter 10. Jesus is saying, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Why did they pick up stones? They knew the law and they were executing the law. Now take a look at verse 33. Many, uh, Jesus answered them. <clears throat> the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man make yourself God. So they knew the law and they were executing the law. Why then they're asking Pilate to crucify Jesus especially since the crucifixion was not a Jewish custom of execution. Because there was another law in which they were more interested in. You see, the Jews of Christ's days identified crucifixion with hanging on a tree. To the Jew to be crucified meant that you have committed an unpardonable sin and you are being punished by irrevocable curse of God, the equivalent of the second death of New Testament Revelation 20. So by crying out, crucify him, the Jews were asking God to pour out his wrath, his curse on Jesus Christ that he may experience the eternal death, goodbye to life forever. And we must remember that the Jews did not believe in the immortality of the soul. This was a Greek pagan concept that came into church later, crept into church. Many still believe in that. And the law that they are referring here to is found in Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. Open your Bibles. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. <clears throat> it reads, If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on a tree, but you shall surely bury him the day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you for, as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Now, let me give you a comparison between dying by stoning and dying by hanging on a tree. If a person is condemned to die by stoning, while he is being stoned and dying, he may turn to God in repentance and have hope for eternal life. 
But if a person is condemned to die, and the judge will say, after you are being killed, you will be hanged on a tree, that meant irrevocable curse of God, the equivalent of the second death. That meant to be forsaken by the life giver. The person was finished. Let me give you a couple of references. One is biblical, one is historical. You remember in the book of Joshua, when uh, Joshua is bringing Israelites to the promised land, five kings joining forces together, they're fighting against Israel. They knew what happened in Egypt. They knew it. And 430 years prior, Moses witnessed to them about their creator. And now when the creator of the whole earth, the universe, is coming with his children to the promised land, instead of opening the doors of their cities and their hearts to get to know him closer, what did they do? They joined their forces and fought against God's people. So by fighting against God's people, against whom they were fighting? Against God himself. God gave victory to his children. Joshua overcame these people, captured these five kings, brought them before Israelite, and basically he said, I'm paraphrasing, these people are not your enemies, they are enemies of God. Therefore you shall kill them and hang them on a tree. Why? To show that irrevocable curse of God was upon these people. On another instance, when the Jews rebelled against Rome and in 70 AD the temple was destroyed, Romans were crucifying 50 Jews every day, those who rebelled against Rome. These people were heroes of Israel. In the country I was born and raised for the heroes of the nation, we were building monuments. Did you know the Jewish historians do not mention in the writings the names of the heroes who were crucified because they consider them to be a curse of God. For them, these people, like they never existed. Now, when Jesus was in the temple and he said these words, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, the Jews understood him that he meant his own body. At the time of Jesus, the high priest was Caiaphas. Caiaphas belonged to the party of Sadducees. Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. Jesus challenged their belief by raising people from the dead. And by saying that he will rise in three days, guess what happened? The Sadducees became the most bitter enemies of Jesus. That's why they were shouting, crucify him. So by condemning Jesus Christ to be crucified, they wanted to be sure that he will never rise again. And the memory of him will be forsaken. That's how the devil hated Jesus and blinded the eyes of the leaders of the Jewish nation. And that's why we as people of God must pray for the leaders of our nation so that the rays of light can penetrate their hearts and minds. So, when the Jews were shouting, crucify him, they wanted God to pour that irrevocable curse on Jesus Christ. Did God do it? That cup of wrath of which Jesus was praying in the garden... Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. That same cup that is mentioned in Revelation, without any mixture of mercy, did God pour that curse on Jesus or not? Any other answer? Yes or no? Yes. Any other answer? <laughs> You're changing your mind, brother. Keep in mind, if you change your mind, the house divided will not stand. Looks like you are all... <clears throat> One-minded, which is good. But <laughs> this was a tricky question. I wanted to wake the audience up because something is coming up. Whichever way you would answer this question would be correct. Here's why. God did not curse Jesus Christ for blasphemy. He did not. Because Jesus is the Son of God. But the curse that rightly belongs to me, the curse that rightly belongs to each one of you, God allowed to fall on Jesus on the cross. In one moment, 2,000 years ago, God had lifted up from each one of us sin, guilt, shame, judgment, the second death, and He placed this on His Son who does not deserve it. 
and it killed him. And I have a good news for you today. The second death he is no longer in your future. Are you rejoicing in it? Wow, I see you do. Me too. The second death is no longer in our future. Why? Because my second death took place in Jesus on the cross. The Seventh-day Adventist Christians must be the happiest people on this planet because of the message that God had entrusted to us. How can we know that this is so? Genesis chapter 3, back to the beginning. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God is coming to the garden and He's speaking to Adam and Eve. Curse is the ground for your sake and will produce what? Thorns and thistles. Now, what was on the head of Jesus when He was on the cross? The symbol of curse. The curse that was pronounced on our planet, on you and on me. Jesus, my Jesus came to take upon himself. Let me reinforce this with another scripture. Galatians chapter 3. Open your Bibles with me. Galatians chapter 3. And uh, let's begin with verse 10. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. By the way, do you hear me well or should I go up or lower? Is that Okay. For as many as are of the works of the law, Galatians 3.10, are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in how many things? In all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You know what it tells me? That every person sitting here today and standing here, we are under the curse. But here's the good news. Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us. From the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ became cursed for you and for me. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You see now the meaning of the death of the cross? Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And when Jesus was on the cross, he was heard to cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did you know what Father did? He turned his face away from Jesus and let him die. Do you know why? I will tell you why. But in order for you to appreciate this answer with, its, with all its depth, there's another answer that will help us. Other question will help us. I will ask the second question. You give me a biblical answer, and then I will go back to the first one. Deal? When Adam sinned, where were we? Don't tell me we didn't exist. Give me a biblical answer, and I can just help you here. This will be the answer of biblical solidarity, biblical oneness. This is very common still in the Middle East, but it's foreign to the Western mind. When Adam sinned, where were we? Who said in him? In, we were in him. We were in Adam. Thank you, brother. For the rest of you, because you did not answer together with the brother, I will guide you to the verse in Hebrew chapter 7. Just to grasp this concept so you could be equipped in future. Hebrews chapter 7 and uh, verse 9 and 10. Something very interesting here. Actually, this, this concept is found all through the Bible. It reads, even Levi who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. The Bible tells us when Abraham met Melchizedek and paid tithes to him, Levi did not exist. He was in Abraham, in his seed, so to say. But whatever Abraham did, because Levi was in his seed, the Bible tells Levi did it also. Are you grasping it? That's the, the concept of biblical solidarity. Now, when Adam sinned, where were we? 
Good. Now we're on one page. We were in Adam. Whatever happened to Adam happened to whom? To all of us. If you don't believe it, walk out on the street, you'll see it. In one man, the devil ruined the whole human race. But God had a plan. That plan was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. I hope you're hearing this verse. Before we were created, before sin entered the human race, before planet was created, God had a plan to save us. Wow, what a God we have. And when the fullness of time came, God sent His Son in the likeness of human flesh. Jesus became the second, the last Adam. And the Bible tells me, all through the Bible, especially the book of Ephesians, the 1 Corinthians 1, 30, that it is of God that we are in Christ. God had put us in Christ. And then Jesus lived sinless life. Now, the same rule that applies to the first Adam, whatever happened to Adam because we were in him, happened to all of us. The same rule now applies to the second Adam. Whatever happened to Jesus, because God had put us in him, now he considers that it happened to, to us. What a good news it is. Whatever happened to Jesus, now God considers that it happened to us. The devil may come and steal it from you, saying, this is not fair. That through one man's righteous act, righteousness came to all men. God steps in and he uses the same passage, saying, listen, buddy, his was not fair. That through one man's sin, sin entered the whole mankind. We were helpless, but God stepped in and he balanced the score for us. That's who our God is. Now, this is the mercy of God. But in the most holy place, in the Hebrew sanctuary, the character of God is depicted with twin characteristics. They are mercy, and the second one is justice. You have heard the mercy, here is the justice now. Then God took the whole human race in the flesh of Jesus and brought it to the cross to meet the justice of the law. Even in the justice of God, there is a mercy for us. So, all mankind was represented in the humanity of Jesus that died on the cross. And when Jesus was on the cross, he, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Father turned his face away from Jesus and let him die. What made the Father to turn his face away from Jesus? Let me make it easier on you. Whom did the Father see on the cross that made him turn away? Who said us? Why don't you make it personal now? Whom did the Father see on the cross? He saw you on the cross. He saw me on the cross. And he turned his face away from Jesus and let Jesus taste your second death. That's why the second death is no longer in our future. So, Jesus not only took your sins to the cross, he went to the cross as you. Not only Jesus died there instead of you, he died there as you. So when Father looked at Jesus, he saw you. He saw me on the cross and allowed Jesus to taste the second death for every man. And the world is dying to hear this good news. In Jesus on the cross, justice and mercy kissed each other. A tremendous collision took place on the cross of Christ between God and man, where all the pain was absorbed by the heart of God. So whatever happened to Jesus, now God considers that it happened to us. This is the gift of God. It is yours by faith. Take hold of it. No one can enjoy the gift unless you take hold of it. And by the way, that includes whatever happened to Jesus, includes his, not only his dying, but also his living. I hope you're hearing it. So, why would Jesus go through such an agony? 
to lose his own existence to save a wretched man like me. Why? I have two answers. Do you want one or two? One or two? I have two answers. Both? You want both? How many would like to have both? Okay. So you ask for it. <laughs> you ask for it. Go ahead, right? You know, I love the writings of Ellen White. In fact, in the afternoon, you'll see why I'm alive today. You'll see the reason why I'm alive today. And that is related to her writings as well. She's very balanced. But unfortunately, many of us, and I myself in the past, I acted that way too. We are taking Ellen White out of the context when we quote her. And we quoted her towards our children in a way, using her quotes as a baseball bat. And that's why we're losing up to 70% of our young people to the world. And that's why many people do not read Ellen White anymore, the growing generation, new generation. She was very balanced. And by the way, she was a pro-gospel writer. Did you know that? She was a pro-gospel. No wonder they are sent out after 1888. They sent her out of the country. Why? Because she was pro-gospel. In fact, she made a statement. She said, when you preach the word of God, pierce them with the needle of the law and sow them with the tread of the gospel. What a balance. So since you ask for both, I'll give you both. Here's the needle of the law. The reason why Jesus went through such an agony to lose his own existence because there is a sin problem still existing and it must be addressed. And many are still playing with sin today. Many. They're trifling with sin. And mentality, the thinking is the same as with antediluvians. They heard the message. They knew it is coming. But they were saying they chose to, to, to enjoy the pleasure of sin a little longer. They were saying when the clouds will come, we will see the clouds, we'll jump on a boat. But the boat sailed, and they were not on it. Today, when we hear His voice, let us not harden our hearts. Let me give you a radical definition of sin, may I? Sin is a blatant mutiny against God. And either sin or God must die in my life. If sin rules in me, the life of God in me will be killed. If God rules in me, Sin in my life will be killed. The culmination of sin was crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And what was true in the history of God on this earth will be true in your history and mine. That is, sin will kill the life of God in us. And here's the second reason why Jesus went through such an agony to lose his own existence to save a wretched people like us. You're right, because of the love. God so loved the world. God the Father and God the Son loved us so much that Jesus was willing to lose his own existence. Now, I want to tell you about that love. How many young people we have here today? Young people, raise your hands, please. I want you to hear this. Young people, raise your hands. Well, you, you look much younger to me than I see hands, you know. <laughs> the rest of you hesitating to raise your hands, basically you're signing your name in a list of older category, huh? All right. <clears throat> My dear young people, the life will throw challenges at you. Your boat will be rocked. It may be rocked so hard, it may spill you out of the boat. You need an anchor, and here's your anchor. The love of God. In John 17, 23, Jesus is praying to his Father in the presence of his disciples, saying, Father, that they may know that you love them as you love me. Now I will bring it home by paraphrasing. Please hear it. God the Father loves you not less than He loves Jesus Christ. They're either in shock or I lost them, Lord. <laughs> let, me, let me try to say from this side. <laughs> God the Father loves you not less than He loves Jesus Christ. I better stay here. <laughs> and then in John 15, 9, Jesus said, Just as much as Father loves me, 
I love you that much. You have God the Father who loves you infinitely. And you have God the Son who loves you infinitely. And then Jesus went to the cross and with his own blood he signed what he just said. And while being on the cross, he's tempted three times. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross and save yourself. Could Jesus do it? Of course he is. He is the Son of God. But could Jesus, by coming down from the cross and saving himself, save us also at the same time? No way. He had to make a choice. What choice did he make? To stay on the cross. What does it say to you? I will tell you what it said to me one day as I was meditating on the scenery of the cross. As Ellen White said, spend a thoughtful hour daily on the scenery of the cross. As I was spending my time researching the cross, listening, reading, studying, the Lord spoke to my heart and to my mind something so profound that it left me in tears for a long time. And I want to share this with you. I brought myself to the cross 2,000 years ago. I invite you, use your sanctified imagination. Imagine that you are 2,000 years ago at the foot of the cross. And as you're looking at the, at the cross of Jesus, after he was beaten, beaten, bleeding, with the crown of thorns, cursed the second death upon himself, he barely can breathe. And as you watch him on the cross, he lifts up his head, he opens his friendly eyes, and he looks at you, and you know that he wants to say something to you. And as you keep watching Jesus on the cross, he lifts himself on the nailed hands in order to be able to speak, to take the breath and to speak his last words. And as you watch him, he lifted himself up and he spoke to you. Have you ever wondered, and died, have you ever wondered what the last words of Jesus would have been to you if you would be there? That's what I've heard. The last words of Jesus from the cross to me. Don't get me wrong, Jesus never uttered these words, but his action speaks louder than any words. And here's what it spoke to my heart, and here's what I'm sharing with every person I meet. Whoever you are, Jesus saying now, whoever you are, whatever country you're coming from, it doesn't matter to me. Whatever color of skin you have, it doesn't matter to me. Whatever you have done in the past, it doesn't matter to me. I love you more than I love myself. And he died. That's the message of the cross. God who loves us more than he loves himself. And having that kind of God is there anything in our lives that can separate us from him. Any worldly thing that can be more dear than Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from our Lord Jesus and his love. Nothing. Only us, we can take ourselves out of his hand. The choice is yours. So, and in a... Hebrew chapter 12, verse 2. The author says to us, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. The joy of Jesus was to give us eternal life. The cross of Jesus was his eternal death. The joy of Jesus to give us eternal life was so much greater than the perspective of him to lose his own existence. I hope you're hearing this. He loves you more than he loves himself. So, the truth of the cross is that Jesus was willing to lose his own existence to save you and me. But he did not suffer the agony of the cross just to forgive us and to leave us in sin. On the cross of Jesus, God made sufficient provision to break the power of sin in our lives. Through the death of Jesus, God declared you righteous. And now he wants to make you into what he declared you to be. How does he do it? By indwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. Maybe Revelation 3.20 can make a bigger sense today. Jesus said, I'm standing at the door and knock. Whoever will open, I will come in. 
Here's the good news of this verse. Jesus Christ already lived in human flesh. Divinity indwelled humanity, and He conquered sin in the flesh. And the reason why He wants to come into your heart and mind, because Jesus wants to repeat the same experience in our lives. Are we letting Him to come in? And if we do, is He coming as a visitor or as a resident? That will make all the difference. So people asking me, is there any practicality to it? It sounds very good, but how can we... Is there any tangible thing in this? How we can actually take it to ourselves and act on it? Very simple. I was struggling, but I found two principles that if you take them, if you live by them, wow, you have no idea what can happen to your Christian growth. You want to hear them? You really? One or two? Everything comes by two today. One or two, even the presentation, morning and the afternoon. <laughs> Would you like to have two, right? How much more time do we have? I'll make it short. <clears throat> I'll make it short. <clears throat> <clears throat> you know, I discovered one principle at the seminar, Victory in Jesus. Blow me away. How many of you heard Bill Liversidge before? He's a very close friend of mine. In that book, Victory in Jesus, you could actually obtain today, uh, you'll find the principle. That, uh, the exercise for you at home will be this. Take your Bible, New Testament, and the concordance. Write three statements. The blood of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, the death of Jesus. And using the concordance, find all the verses in New Testament that have that statement. In them, you'll find something very profound. You know what you'll find? God's gift to you. Very nicely packaged, but they are sitting on your table for a long time now. You never unwrap them. Now I challenge you to unwrap them. So you will find up to 50 Gifts, I call them benefits of the cross of Jesus, of the blood of Jesus, of the death of Jesus. I'll give you a couple of them so you could actually begin to develop the appetite for them. Justification, Romans 5, 9, you'll find that through the blood of Jesus we are justified. If one single person cannot understand justification, it basically declared righteous. For example, if I would steal from you something and you forgive me, I would still be a forgiven thief. If I have done something against God and He forgives me, Bible calls justified, declared righteous, as if I never done anything wrong. Yeah. That is a gift of God to you. Through the blood of Jesus, you can stand before Jesus, before God, as you never sinned. That's a gift of God. You have salvation. If it says you have salvation, you have salvation. You have peace. With God. You have resurrection from the dead, freedom from sin, purified conscience, washed from sin, redeemed from the curse of the law, forgiveness, grace, adoption, eternal perfection is yours, Hebrew 10 14. And many, many more. When you come to the foot of the cross every morning of your life, take one or two of these gifts and begin to meditate. How much it cost God to give that one single gift to you, being justified to stand before God as you never done anything wrong. It cost His own existence to give you that. When you meditate on that, in your heart and mind will be raised gratitude. And whenever God is seeing gratitude in the heart of His child, you know what He does? He imparts the Holy Spirit to the child. And the importation of the Holy Spirit according to the Bible and Desire of Ages, 805 page. The importation of the Holy Spirit is the importation of the life of Christ. Here you have it. You come to the foot of the cross. Take hold of one of the benefits. Appreciate the gift. God will impart the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the life of Jesus into you. And I have a good news for you. Jesus in you is never attracted to sin. 
That's how victorious Christian life is possible. The other one is like it. Spend daily time in the Word of God. I mean daily. Today, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, 40% drop in studying and reading the Word of God. No wonder the churches are growing weak. Spend time in the Word of God. Not only read it or study, but do what it says. The moment as you act upon the Word of God, you can have an assurance that the Holy Spirit is in you. Because it is He who wills and does His good pleasure in you. And the function of the Holy Spirit again is the importation of the life of Christ. And Christ in you is not attracted to sin. That's how simple it is. Even child can understand. You don't need to have a theological degree to understand the simple truth of the Lord. How He wants to make you now into what He declared you to be. Very simple. Act on it. And I can guarantee if the Lord willing, if I will be invited next year, I can guarantee you there will be not a single spot available in the pew because people will begin to see Christ in you. And those who see Christ will be ending up here. Guarantee you. In the afternoon, there will be a session that will help the church to fulfill this commission because the session is targeted to those who would like to see unity in the church. It all will come from the Word of God. And as you go through the second session, I can guarantee you there will be unity in the church. And whenever there is a unity in the body, I don't know, maybe you already have the unity, but it will strengthen the unity. And whenever the unity exists in the body of Jesus, whenever, the fullness of God will be revealed through that body and the power of God. Guaranteed. Because that's how God operates. Through one single member of the church, the fullness of God is never revealed. Come in the afternoon, you'll hear more about this. And uh, also the testimony will be presented. And in conclusion, I will give you one, maybe enough for the stories, huh? In London, there is a, there is a station, subway. One of the stations has a large cross. As people travel to the subway of London, they come to that station, they see the cross, they know where they are, they know which direction to go from there. One day, a little girl was lost in the subway of London. As she was sitting on a sidewalk, she was crying. A policeman was walking by. She saw her crying, came up to her, asked her, why are you crying? She said, I am lost. He said to her, tell me your mom's telephone number. I will call her. She will come and get you. She said, I don't know my mom's telephone number. She kept crying. He said, that's okay, honey. Tell me your address. I will take you home. She said, I don't know even my address. And she kept crying. Then... He told her, that's okay, tell me the name of your street. I will take you there. We'll find your home. She said, I don't know even the name of my street. And she kept crying. Then didn't know what else to ask. He asked her last question. Tell me, what do you know? Suddenly she stopped crying. There was a spark in her eyes. She wiped her tears. And with a smile on her face, she said to him, if you could take me to the cross, I will find my way from home. My ho I will find my way home from there. If you could take me to the cross, I will find my way home from there. I hope I was able to bring you to the foot of the cross today. My prayer for you that you will make it your daily habit to come to the foot of the cross because it is from the foot of the cross you'll be finding the way to your father's home and to your father's heart every day. God bless you as you make it your habit. Now I, I will have to ask the... Uh, the deacons, I know they're waiting for me there for 10 minutes, solidly waiting for me when I'm going to finish. So, how many of you did not receive the envelope of the ministry? Raise your hand, they will give it to you. You all have it, right? So, you've heard the report of the ministry, what the ministry is involved. Is the Lord is, if the Lord is touching your hearts today, and you would like to support this ministry, to take the gospel to Muslims, because until they hear the word of God, the the three angels' message, the gospel. Jesus is not coming. Because he said this gospel will be preached to all the nations, including them. Then the end will come. So if you want Jesus to come soon, then this is uh, what we can do at least for, for it.
and as Moses was uh, praying for the children of Israel and in the bottle, his hands were tired, going down, and what happening? Israelites were losing the bottle. When Hur and Aaron supported his hands, the Israelites were victorious. Every ministry needs support. And today, this ministry is with you. If the Lord is touching your heart, your support is greatly appreciated. I will stop here. They will be passing by. You can just put your gifts. And at the end of the year, we'll be sending your receipts. Uh, it is the, a sure harvest ministry. If you're writing a check, I think it should be here. Or it's gone. But anyway... <clears throat> If you need uh, more envelopes, you can see me afterwards. And again, what time do we meet? Around 2, two o'clock, right? Okay. And uh, by the way, while deacons are taking up the free will offering, I want to mention something very important. Several of you raised your hands that you knew Pastor Bill Liversidge. Was he here in the church with the seminar? What, which year was it? Several years ago. You know, uh, uh, have you seen his uh, programs on uh, TV, uh, the uh, Hope Channel, 3ABN, LLBN? So uh, I was directing the media production for him. And uh, when he passed away, the board asked me to lead his ministry. This is my other big plate that I'm carrying. And any place I go, I bring these materials because whatever I can present, it is this much comparing to what he can bless you with all the seminars that are available today, including the Victory in Jesus in the format of books, CD, and the DVD. This seminar transformed me completely. I knew all the doctrines. I was sitting in the church for a number of years. I was excited about the doctrines. And please, understand me, nothing wrong with our doctrines. Seventh-day Adventist teaching, the doctrines, they are superior. They are superior, but I did not know Jesus, and I did not understand the gospel. The moment I attended that seminar, the light for me went on. When I understood the gospel, the fire was in my heart. I could not contain that fire. I ended up in ministry. Let us pray. Gracious, loving Father, Thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and his precious blood that cleanses us from all sins. Father, our hearts are touched and moved by the depths of the love that you have towards us and what you have done through the atoning blood of Jesus. You justified us, you reconciled us, you adopted us as your children, and we are no longer condemned. And now, Father, we pray that your grace will fall upon us afresh every single day, that we may come to the foot of the cross, beholding that undistorted picture of God and claiming all the benefits of the atoning death of Jesus, that you may bring the very life and the mind of Christ into us, and Christ in us will not be attracted to sin. He will be living his life in us and through us, and people in the community will be attracted to Jesus. Father, bless this congregation in a very special way. Bless the pastor, the elders. Give them double portion of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And I pray for every single member. You know the needs of your children, Father. You are the God who provides for every need. You are the God of healer, those who are ill, Father. Be with them in a special way. Be with elderly and weak. Put your arms around them, Father, and carry them through the challenges of life. And in a special way, be with our young people. Oh, Father, enlighten their path and pour your spirit upon them and give them grace to walk in your ways, Father, not in the ways that the world is inviting them to harm them. Bless our children, Father, and keep them closer to your heart. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
God bless you all. We'll see you at 2 o'clock.